Good morning. Good morning. Let's begin with prayer. Father, the psalmist writes about Solomon in Psalm 72. May he have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May people be blessed in him. All nations call him blessed. Thank you that you, we have one greater than Solomon, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He with Doug Camp, as he leads us to worship, and Bruce Henderson, as he intercedes for the church, and our pastor, that by his words and the spirit, we may celebrate the glorious hope and joy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Let's stand. You're the call to worship. Psalm 108. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Let's do just that this morning as we would sing praise to him. Hymn number 219, O Worship. infinite power, created heaven and earth, and all that is within them in the space of six days, and all very good. 
you are a God of pure light, in whom there's no darkness at all. You are pure in every respect. All of you is perfection. You are thrice holy. You cannot abide sin. And yet, Lord, you have provided for us, a sinful people, oh. bountifully. You care for our day-by-day -day needs. You care for our eternal needs. The tender mercy and matchless care. You have set your boundless love upon us and become not only our defender, but also our redeemer and our friend. We adore you, O Lord, our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this matchless work, for your bountiful grace, for your goodness and mercy. We adore you this morning. We praise you as the only true and living God, worthy of all power, all blessing, honor, and glory. We ask, Father, you be with us now, go us with your spirit, that we might worship you this morning and give you the praise that you do. And be blessed in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand now. Let's join together as we pray that prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Tenth of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet. From Exodus 20, it reads, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. I've worked through this commandment several times over the years, and I'm actually working my way through it from one end to the other. So the latter half of this commandment, as we look at it from the Westminster Confession and from the larger catechism, deals really with more our condition and our heart. And the last portion of that speaks of a full contentment that's required on our part with our condition. In such a charitable frame of the whole soul, i.e. everything within you, toward our neighbor, as that all our inward motions and affections, touching him regarding those individuals, tend unto and further all that good, which is his. So we want good for them, sometimes perhaps even at our own cost. Mm -hmm. It speaks of being content with our condition, with everything that we have, and to be pleased, and even rejoice in every, everything good that our neighbor has. So the phrase that I'm looking at specifically out of this at the moment is the fact that we are to be content, content with our condition. And when we speak of contentment with our condition, we're not merely just speaking of you know, the physical flesh, even though that's a part of it. We're talking about rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and in, and in everything, giving thanks. So this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Just from 1 Thessalonians 5. The point that we are to be rejoicing, 
praying without ceasing and giving thanks in all circumstances. So that means that we're giving thanks and praising our God for the crummy job that we have. Or for the rundown car that we happen to have. Or perhaps the spouse that doesn't live up to our expectations. Or perhaps the lack of a spouse. Or even the loss of a spouse. We're going to be giving thanks and be praising our God. The children that are disobedient. Or who disappoint us in some way. Or for the lack of the absence of those children. Or perhaps the health condition that we've had so many years that brings us misery, discomfort, pain, disability. We're to give thanks for loneliness, for weakness, for uselessness, fearfulness in a world that seems to be against us all around. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we're not to pray about these things. We're not to take them to our Lord. He calls us, he asks us, he tells us, commands us even. That we would take all of our cares, all of our needs to him. But of course, we also know that he knows them before we ask. And the point is, is that these are not to be things that we're bemoaning constantly, which is, I think, what we tend to do. That instead, in the midst of these trials and these difficulties, we know that our Father in heaven, he not only knows our need, but he loves us and cares for us, and provides for us what we need, for what is ultimately good. And I think that's what we lose sight of. So easily we lose sight of that. Because of what? It comes about us. So the challenge is to look first to our Father in heaven, to ask that he would grant us the faith and the trust that we truly believe what he tells us, that he cares for us and loves us somehow find that we're able to rejoice even in the midst of trial, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of something not living up to our expectations, knowing that he is not only able, but is doing what is best and needed for each of us. So where we fall short of that, we repent. And if by some small chance any one of you happens to think you're doing kind of okay, um, I'll just mention a word that uh, Jesus had to a young man who thought he also did things pretty well. The statement was, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have a treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. So again, where we fall short, let's turn to our Father in heaven. And not to make too much noise in the microphone. But let's join together in the confession of sound that you find here in the bulletin. O great and everlasting God, who dwells in unapproachable light, who searches and knows the thoughts and intentions of the heart, we confess that we have not loved you with all our heart, nor with all our soul, nor with all our mind, nor with all our strength, nor our neighbors as ourselves. We have loved what we are not to our Father. We have covered what is not ours. We have not been content with your provisions for us. We have complained in our hearts about our family, about our friends, about our health, about our occupations, about your church, and about our friends. We have sought our security in those things which perish rather than in you, the everlasting God. Chasing, cleanse, and forgive us through Jesus Christ, who is able for all time to save us who approach you through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear this declaration of pardon from Colossians chapter 2. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with, with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. 
with Moose. Pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the beauty of the earth. All nature sings your glory and your works proclaim your might. Thank you for the thrill of each new day and receiving new mercies every morning. Thank you for the rain that waters a parched land and revives it. So too, we thank you for the stream of living water you have given to those who know you. Thank you for the joy of human love. Thank you for brother, sister, parent, and child. Thank you for friends on earth and friends above. Thank you for this precious gift of relationships. Thank you, Heavenly Father, as we rejoice with former EPC member Bethany Larson Nichols and her husband Brandon at the announcement that they are expecting a child. Yes. We pray for the health of mother and child as Bethany and Brandon experience the joy of the special gift you have given them. Thank you for the good news received from African Bible College concerning staff member Sully Lowell as he is doing physical therapy and in good spirits from reports received. We ask, Lord, for his continued improvement and peace in you as he enters his final days of stay in the hospital in South Africa. Thank you for Mary Pettit's successful hip replacement surgery. We pray for a resolution to the lingering effects of the anesthesia from the surgery and also continued healing, that she would be strengthened both physically and spiritually. We thank you, Father, that Marianne Rulo is doing well and experiencing a positive result from a recent steroid injection. We pray for continued significant progress in her mobility. Father, we thank you also for RUF and pray for Amanda Cunningham as she seeks to raise the remaining $15,000 for this next year at the University of Maryland. After leaving LSU and Baton Rouge, she and Caleb rejoice in knowing this is where God has called them for the time being, but are sad in knowing they left an amazing community and group of students behind. We pray that they would find community in DC and not play the comparison game between both places. We also pray, Lord, that following the hard decisions recently made, you would grant them both physical and mental rest and recuperation in the next few weeks before beginning their new chores. We thank you, Lord, for the many opportunities Sharon Sousa has to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses in your building. We ask for your courage, for her courage, understanding, and wisdom as she shares the true gospel in her conversations. We pray for our grief share friend Lisa and her close friend Kathy, whose son Andy is recovering from a life threatening accident. We ask for continued progress for Andy in the long road of rehabilitation. For Lisa and Kathy, as they deal with the emotion and anxiety of seeing Andy go through this trial. And we lift them all up to your care that in this time they would come to know you are the healer and would comfort them. We lift up Samaritan's Purse working in Yemen amidst the country's ongoing civil war, Lord. May your protective hand be upon these willing workers as they enter the killing fields to bring good news as they treat acute malnutrition and other medical conditions in both children and families. May they be able to establish relationships and be able to give hope in the midst of despair with the true bread of life. Father, we pray for our friends, Jamie and Jackie, and for their <coughs> friends, Gabriel and his wife. Mm -hmm. Lord, you know Gabriel's wife who was in hiding in Southeast Asia has been found by her father's henchmen you know, he is a very powerful and wealthy man, that he is furious that she is a Christian, and his fury is exacerbated by the fact that she married a Christian. You know, Lord, that Gabriel is fearful returning would result in his rearrest and torture. And you know that Gabriel's wife is fearful of beatings and being forced to marry a man of her father's faith. We pray, Lord, for your protective hand to be upon this situation. 
that Gabriel and his wife would be able to trust totally in you, that they will find comfort in your grace, that they would rest in your love and know that you are enough. Your will be done. We lift up Pastor McGee and the efforts of New Hampshire Alliance to bring forward the right statement on ethnicity in the Bible. May the Lord lead all involved in this project. We pray for the church in New Hampshire as ministers seek to work together in positive ways to love and serve you. May they and we truly live Micah 6 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Heavenly Father, grant a special blessing on our pastor as he reads and preaches your word this morning. Grant to us ears to hear, <coughs> minds to understand, and hearts to embrace the truth you desire to impart amongst all gathered here this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, we are starting a new book that we're reading today in terms of our Old Testament passage. We're in the book of Exodus, chapter one today. This is the Bible over again. And uh, we hear God's word as we realize that um, a lot of time has passed between the end of Genesis to now the beginning of Exodus. And here's the situation that God's people face in the book of Exodus. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, but they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Mm -hmm. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the night, <coughs> but you shall let every daughter live. So we'll talk about that tonight in our evening service. And we're looking at Matthew's gospel, continuing in that. We're looking at verses 22 through uh, 28. <laughs> then a demon 
oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, to Jesus, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So we'll, we'll have more to say in future weeks. Just go slowly through the rest of that section. But 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 8. So this is the end of 1 Thessalonians as we make our way to 2 Thessalonians next week. So 1 Thessalonians 5. That's the last, uh, last part of that passage. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, see that no one rep repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, and do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our lord jesus christ he who calls you is faithful he will surely do it brothers pray for us greet all the brothers with a holy kiss i put you under oath before the lord to have this letter read to all the brothers the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you and now back to Isaiah, you know, Stan, we've come to Isaiah 60, Isaiah 60, Isaiah. hear God's word in our passage of the morning, beautiful, beautiful passage for us in a great section of the book of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see they all gather together, they come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. <clears throat> the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar and I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me. The ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. Foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings 
shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Your gates shall be open continually, day and night. They shall not be shut, that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion and the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall nurse at the breast of kings. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. And instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down nor your moon withdraw itself for the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord in its time. I will hasten. Please be seated. So in looking at this wonderful passage that we have before us today, I want you to look for a second at what we have in the verses just before it and what we have in the verses right after. Because remember the chapters, you know, these chapter breaks here are, are something that were done by human beings. We have a, a long section here in Isaiah and it, and it flows. So you have to pay attention to what went before and what comes afterwards. So just wanna show you verse 20 of the prior chapter. It says a redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. That was our key verse last week when we looked at so what we have here is the Redeemer right at the center of everything that Isaiah is talking about. And we know for, for certain that Jesus is this Redeemer who has come. And by his own blood, he has redeemed us, that the purchase price for us was his life and death. Now, what follows just confirms this all the more. It says here, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And it goes on. This passage was the one that Jesus preached from when he was beginning his public ministry. And at the end of it, he said, this passage has found its fulfillment in your hearing. So how can we have any doubt about the fact that Christ is really right in the midst of everything so wonderful that's being talked about in Isaiah? Now, there are aspects of Isaiah 60 that we could say already that was fulfilled, even in the coming of Jesus, of course, of course he said that. But even for Israel, there were things that already had happened. But then in the coming of Christ and in the, in the calling of the church from all the nations, we'd already say, look, this has already happened. And we could also say that this is right now. 
happening in our midst as all these various people groups are being brought into the body of Christ. Something that's described in the verses that we read. But then there's also a part of this that we'd say it has not yet been fulfilled. And that really brings us to the book of Revelation, where some of the very same images are picked up right from Isaiah 60. And we know that this has to do with the coming of the new heavens and the new earth and the glory of God in the glorious environment of eternity that you and I have been promised and that we'll live in. Amen. Amen. Absolutely, right? Where's Debbie Schaefer when we need her? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> she might be listening on that little box. I don't know. Debbie, we miss you. All right. All right. So, amen. <laughs> that this is such a great future for us, and it's the way the Bible closes. And we could say that there's a part of this that our hearts are yet longing for, and we strengthen our souls in the hope of the resurrection. So there's an already and a not yet that's happening here with this passage. So much here, I'm going to just summarize and focus on some, some par parts here because it actually holds together in a beautiful way. Verses 1 through 16 talk about not only Israel, but the nations shall come to the light and, and their glory shall come to God's assembly. That somehow, whatever this final city of the Lord is, whatever the final temple of God is, that there are going to be people coming from every tribe and tongue and nation. So all being brought in. And, and this has to do with the light shining that has everything to do with the Redeemer who is able to say, Today, you, you, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. That Jesus is the light who shines. Arise, shine, now we will, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So this, this glorious light in God himself expressed so beautifully in Jesus that we could say, if we see him as Messiah, if our souls can gaze upon him and say, this is the glory of God, this is the answer for my every need, then something has happened where light is now shining in what was previously darkness. And it says here, darkness shall cover the earth. Yes, indeed. And thick darkness, the peoples, the various people groups of the earth, but the Lord will arise upon you, not just, I believe, the Jews, although certainly from among the Jews, there would be those who would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that would enable them to be lights, to be a city on a hill. But then as others see this from among the various people groups of the earth, they too become the light of the world. As Christ himself is the light, now Jews and Gentiles all over the earth are like a beacon to all those who are living in darkness. And it says, come here, come and find the light in Jesus Christ. You do not need to live in a deep, dark cave, not seeing the light of eternity. You should see the light and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your life. So it's inescapable that there's something that's actually supposed to happen to us that enables us to be the light of the world. That's got to come from God. Because we were in deepest darkness. We didn't know the way out of the cave. And it wasn't just a matter of having a map and the directions. We were blind. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. We've been resuscitated by a life-giving God. Okay. Now, just one little part of that I'm just going to focus on here just for a second. Verse 13, it talks about one of the nations, and several nations are mentioned. It just says, the glory of Lebanon shall come to you. See, we have a certain glory in this fading world. So we see certain things where we could say, wow, was, was that jewelry ever wonderful? What, a, what an amazing thing. Or you could look at a particular scene around us and say, that, that, is, that is glorious. We might even use that word. Say it's, it's glorious. 
And there are all kinds of things in this world that we could look at. And I mean, I know for me, I regularly might say that dinner was glorious. You know? <laughs> so there's all kinds of things that our bodies readily enjoy, our hearts to sing to the reality of that. Isn't this really wonderful? Well, look, all of the glory that the world has to offer, all that is in the nation of Lebanon that was to the north of Israel, all of that is going to have to go south. It's going to head toward the kingdom of the God of Israel, the kingdom of heaven. And that somehow all of that is going to come streaming in. And I just use Lebanon as one example. What did they have? Well, they had great things for building ships, uh, wood that was useful for constructing. Things. All of that was going to come in into the temple. I don't really believe we're just talking about a building here because somehow he starts in this passage to talk about people who are the you that are mentioned here. The people will be the ones that will be the city and they'll be the temple. So we had a physical temple that was blessed with cedars from Lebanon. That was great in its day. We've got something much more than that. All that's glorious in this temporary world is coming into the kingdom of God. And there's no one that can stop it from happening because God wills that that's what's going to happen. What that, of course, tells us is don't get too dedicated to grasping on to the things of this world that we say are glorious. God's got a plan for that. If you're in Lebanon, well, that, all those things you call glorious, they're going south. They're going to Jerusalem. They're going into God's kingdom, God's people. That's where it's all headed. So set your heart on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that new Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven yeah. from God without spot or blemish or any such thing. That is far more glorious. Why? Because God is glorious. You know, the angels that Isaiah saw in chapter 6. They had these wings and they're covering over even themselves, even holy angels. I'm, I'm embarrassed to be around him. It's too much for me because his glory is so great. And then they have two extra wings there and they fly off in the glorious plan of God. We ought to be people with wings. The glory of God say, ah, I have seen the glory of the Lord. Give me wings. I want to fly forward to do what God has for me to do. I don't want to be so wedded to things that are so temporary and going to be gone that have such really a lesser glory than God. I've seen something that shines brighter than all of that. That's what we need to be. So that's the first 16 verses. And then it really follows what, uh, what comes in 17 through the end of the chapter is that instead of things that are temporary and even cursed by God, you're, we're going to have the blessed that will be there, not just temporary either, but more permanent. Everything's going to be more permanent. So we have different images used to help us to see that. Did you notice that? You know, instead of bronze, we have gold and so forth. It just keeps on going. Each thing that's mentioned said instead of something that was, well, might have seemed like it lasts a long time. But this other thing, wow, that'll last a lot longer. And that's that's shiny and wonderful. Okay, so he's saying, look, whatever you have here now, it's going to be better. And, and here's why, verse 19, the Lord will be your everlasting life and your God will be your glory. So we, we need to just set our hearts again on that. All this holds together. It's a beautiful passage just in reading it. And I think if I talked about every word, I'd probably ruin it. You heard it read. It's good. It's great. Let's, let's try and apply it. I'm going to focus on verse 15, just a part of that verse. I'm going to talk about four things in that verse here. It's, uh, it's Isaiah 60, verse 15. I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. I will make you majestic forever a joy from age to age a lot of important points to see here in these few words first the word you here it's wonderful what we can glean from the hebrew on this point the reason is 
See, when we say you in English, unless we're Lynn, right? <laughs> we don't even know if it's plural or if it's singular, right? But if we come from where Lynn came from, we'd say you all, and then we know something. But <laughs> Hebrew, Hebrew goes further than that. So you're all right. So Hebrew, go, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> so Hebrew goes further than that. Not only can you see whether it's singular or plural, you can also see whether the you is feminine or masculine. Did you know that? So you can put a little preposition on the end of the word in Hebrew, and it could be a you. And as it is here over and over again, it's feminine singular. Interesting. So God is saying all this about a woman. Who is this woman? His Israel, especially his church, the bride of the Redeemer, the Messiah, King, you, you shall have all of this. How blessed you are. Just brings me back to Psalm 45 when there's this dialogue about a woman who's going to be married and king. And she's, she's really, it's a soul wrenching experience for her. She's wondering about what she's leaving and is it all worth it? And so the psalmist says, look, forget about the, the, what you're leaving behind. Your husband is so great, right? Again, this is what we need to know. This is what you need to know. Church of Jesus Christ, here in Exeter, here at Exeter Presbyterian, with churches around the world, from every denomination and every <laughs> tribe and tongue, you are to be a glorious bride because of the glory of your husband, Jesus Christ, who has the glory of God in him. Even now at the right hand of the Father, so full of glory. He's shining in your souls. You've been born again from above, but now that glory will shine out into the world. And more and more we say, why was I so stressed about what I was giving up for this husband? This husband is glorious. I want to go in his direction. All right, that's the first one. You. Now the next two I deal with together. Majestic and a joy. It's somehow... The shining of Jesus on you, church, makes you majestic and joyful. When you looked at yourself in the mirror this morning, you might have thought, I don't know if I use either of those words. I don't look majestic. I think it would be the rare person here today. So you look marvelous. You look majestic. You're perfect. You're kingly or queenly. <laughs> and maybe even joy seems to be fleeting from you. And you're rushing and you're just trying to trying to do the things you have to do. But he says one, one day you're just going to have shining so obviously from you. Majesty and joy that came from Almighty God. This word majesty most often is translated pride. It has to do with swelling. When I want to be someone, here's what I do. I raise my hands way up as, as high as I can. You know, I went to the doctor this week and they told me I was a half an inch shorter. That really irritated me. <laughs> so I, I wanted to say, let me, let me just try that. <laughs> so raise it up high. Now, I found if I go this way, I get a little pain in my left arm. So that's not glorious. So I go this way and all of a sudden it swells. Well, that's the idea of this Hebrew word of majesty's puffed. It's puffed up. And so sometimes it's used in a negative way when somebody who shouldn't be puffed up is all puffed up. Ooh, that's me. You know, so I go, go down, get humble again, right? You start having a slumping look. Like, no, look, you're, you're going to be the pride and joy of Almighty God and of the earth in some way that you're going to see. Here are these glorious ones. Chosen by God, we love because he first loved us, set his loving affection upon you, not to leave you just as I am forever, but to take you where he is and to make you what he has for you to be in him. And oh, you start to feel puffed up a little bit. Not, not bad, you know, not, not, not in a bad way, in the way where like a loving father would look at you and say, you know, you're my, you're my pride and joy. That's what God is saying about you and about me. In Isaiah 60, he said, I see you. I see you where you are. 
And even now you're my pride and joy. Because I see you and what I'm doing with you. And some of you are going through some dark afflictions, some difficulties. And you find it really hard to see that. And here he is. He's saying that this is the way for you. And then lastly on that verse, from age to age. From age to age, it says. Well, this isn't saying like from going to 63 to 64, which by the way, I'm doing next month. And I can tell you the specific date to get everything ready. for the happy birthday. <laughs> It's not just talking about, okay, I went from this age to this next age. No, it's talking much more than that because you can see it in the passage. There are certain things in there that are very clearly happening in the gospel age as the peoples are coming from all over the earth and brought, brought into the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's this age. We call it the age of the church militant, not with swords loud clashing or ro role of stirring drum or anything like that. No, with deeds and love of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom is coming. It's, we're militant. We're proclaiming the truth of Christ. And we're convinced that God is right and that we'll stand with him by his grace, even if all the world should be against us. That's the courage that fills our souls and our hearts to be able to say we're going the Lord's way. All right. So that's this age, but it's from age to age. So there's coming a time when the church militant age will be over and you know what follows right the church triumphant see right now we look and it doesn't all look glorious of course think about the cross of christ did not look very glorious looked horrible it looked like an obvious loss like something had gone deeply deeply wrong but with with the eyes of faith for those who are actually with the light of the Lord, able to look on it and say, I glory in the cross of Christ. We're able to do that. That's the key for this age right now. See, the Lord will bless his covenant community from age to age. One day, you will not need to have anything but just the eyes of resurrection that you have, and you're going to see it all right there. Your body and your soul working entirely together. No more sin. No more death, no more sorrow or sadness, no weeping or mourning or crying anymore. But now, glory to God in the highest, right there with every breath that you breathe. And you'll say, yes, this is the age triumphant. I am so blessed to be a part of this age. And so we have this missionary age that we're in right now. It's really wonderful. I think it's a great, great thing to be a part of. But then we have the age that's coming where we say, okay, the missionary endeavor is actually over. And now we have koinonia fellowship with God together with a whole communion of God's people here. Okay, three quick things here. Look, do not miss the seed of eternal majesty and joy in the current gospel era. So I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God is saying about you, you're my pride and joy right now. He's saying that. How can I bring that across to you? See, I think if you're living the Isaiah 58 life and, you know, on the other side of this, like, let's just point to something. Like, uh, we've had over the last few days, if, if you've been going into Isaiah 58, last few days, we've had all things that have to do with getting rid of slavery. It says for uh, the 4th of August, loose the bonds of wickedness, undo the straps of the yoke. You get it? Break every yoke. Share your bread with the hungry is today's. So what, over the last few days, what we've been looking at is saying, you know, there's a lot of people that are in bondage in this world, but we are about breaking the yoke. We're actually about looking and seeing, hey, brother, sister, you're trapped in some mess. Is there something that I can do that would break that yoke by the power of Christ at work in his beloved bride? 
is there anything I can do in order to help with that? May God use me. That's a wonderful thing for the church to be engaged in. It's also wonderful to feed the hungry. And I don't mean just people that are starving. I mean, anytime you actually put forward food for others to eat, it's a provision for them. And it, it, it helps the body to live, but also delight to the soul as well to have those good gifts given. See, that's an Isaiah 58 life, just part of that. If you're living that life, I'm telling you that even just a cup of cold water to a little child in the name of Jesus, that is like pride and glory, pride and joy, realities as God looks out upon his church. So how do I communicate that to you? Here's a, here's a couple of things. I'm reading uh, a story I like to read every year. There's certain books I like to read every year. And I'm on, on my second time through this one. This is one of uh, John Coskery's relatives. John and Marcia Coskery are related to a woman who did pioneer missionary work in China. And I love to read her simple story of starting life in Massachusetts and ending up with the Liso people in China and being a part of everything that was going on there. So I, I like to read it. It's, it's just impressive. I like to read the story of Steve Levitt's dad. I usually do that every uh, New Year's Day, somewhere on New Year's Day. I'll read his autobiography that he wrote about himself. I think the thing I like about both of those people, they were both missionaries in different ways. But the thing about it is they weren't like triumphant missionaries here. Everybody knows their name. Lots of books are written about them. And no, they were regular people, actually. And the part that I really rejoice in is the regular people part of what they did. So that uh, Jenny, at the end of her life, she just happened to mention at a family uh, reunion that she's come to the point where in her two or three hours of prayer in the morning, she doesn't go down on her knees anymore at 90 years old. And she says, I, I think God understands that, don't you? And everybody was like, <laughs> she's just a, reg a regular person who happened to maybe have not that much in life at that point to do, but she did because she had kind of seen the light and saw what it was and that, that informed her. She saw the glory of the world to come as being more than the passing glory of Lebanon and realized, okay, this is the way to live. And with Ray, it was the same, Ray Levitt, it was the same way. He's just kind of moving from thing to thing. You finish up one thing, maybe have a little disappointment on it. What's the next thing? What's the next door that's open? And, and each time along the way, he's blessing people. He's helping people. And so then later in life for his descendants, they get the privilege of meeting people who say, oh, your father really made a big difference in my life. What? Why? Because he has a Wikipedia article? No. He doesn't have, you can search, he's not there, right? But there's someone who said, you're my pride and joy, all right? And, and here's, the, here's the thing that gets me. This one is, is just, this is something that happened in, I think it was 1973. Remember who was president in 1973? And he was resigning, he had resigned. He's talking to his staff at that point. Maybe you watched this on TV like I did. It was really quite moving. Whatever you thought of Richard Nixon, this was actually pretty moving. He's talking to his staff. His guard is kind of down. He's just gone through the most grueling thing ever, right? And he's in the middle of what he had some prepared remarks. And all of a sudden, this is what he said. Nobody will ever write a book probably about my mother. Well, I guess all of you would say this about your mother. My mother was a saint. And I think of her, two boys dying of tuberculosis, nursing four others in order that she could take care of my older brother because she was allowed in the room. So she had to take care of four others while she was there. She did that happily. For three years in Arizona, she did that and seeing each of them die. And when they died, it was like one of her own. Yes, she will have no books written about her but she was a saint, glory. Now, you, you know what? He, he was a pretty good prophet. I think there might've been one book written about her. It's out of print. <laughs> no, no, nobody will care out there. But I'll tell you that 
there was something about her life, this, this woman that nobody really knew about. And he uses the word saint, which is the word that you use to talk about members of the body of Christ. So, so here's what I really want to say. It's not about Richard Nixon's mom. It's, it's not about Ray Levitt. It's, it's not about um, Jeannie Fitzwilliams. Is that right? Yeah. Jeannie's story. It's about you. All right? And here's what I'm saying. Your life is a book worth reading. Even if nobody would ever write that book. What I'm telling you is that your life is a book worth reading. You're not some accidental person. You have been brought into the beautiful body of Christ, the bride that will one day be so clearly glorious that no one would dispute my assertion that your life actually matters. But I'm telling you here in advance, your life is a book worth reading. And that's why I so enjoy getting to know it because I like reading the book. And if it were in writing, I'd be happy to read it every year. But as it is, when I see you, I get to know a little bit more about that book and I'm very happy to read it. Secondly, celebrate not only this time right now where I'm saying already you're pride and joy, but celebrate the Christian hope of a far greater majesty and joy uh, the joy of the coming heavenly age, because there is life beyond the ordinary. There's Jesus. There's the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And then there's what John saw, the glorious Jesus in heaven. And there's part of this that just is like a veiled glory. It's hidden to people, like I said about the cross. They wouldn't have thought of it as glorious, but we see it. But then there's the reveal where you can't mess it. All right. And then finally, last thing I'll say is this. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See, if all this sounds so foreign to you, where you think, that guy up there, he jumps around a lot, he wails his, you know, flails his arms around and stuff. Look, is there something you're missing here in what I'm saying where you say, I just don't connect that? or you just don't know me, and that's why you're saying this. Uh, I don't know where the light is. I want, to, I want to invite you in the way that Paul did in Ephesians. Now, he says these words in Ephesians 5, 14, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. But he makes it like this is something we all say. Like there must have been some song, right? There must have been some song that, gave, that actually got this across and that Christians were regularly singing it because there would be people that would come into their midst and they'd want to sing that song. Awake, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. It's like Ezekiel, you know, preach to the dead bones, preach to the wind that the wind might come out, come into the person and bring life. And that's what I want to do here today. If you feel like I'm just so dead, say, look, I just preach to the wind that it comes into your heart and that you would know that you're alive. Hey, wake up, wake up, come on, wake up. You're my pride and joy, Jesus says. I love you. You're not some accidental uh, result of evolutionary processes that have no meaning. You are my beloved bride together with the whole body of Christ. And, and so I'll leave you with this thought. What will you do after your retirement is over? <laughs> right? Sometimes it takes a few seconds to get that one. <laughs> I'm not saying what will you do in your retirement? Well, that's interesting. But what are you going to do when your retirement is over? Because I think, you know, I think you ought to wake up now. Awake. Rise from the dead. Christ will give you life. And then you're able to make that distinction and say, okay, I enjoy the things of this world that God has given me to enjoy here. But there is a glory that's so far beyond it 
that I don't want to get blinded by a little match compared to the blinding light of the glory of Almighty God. This other thing is just temporary. It, you know, one day it's gone. But this other is eternal as God himself is eternal. Let us pray. Father, we come to you as to the living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to you as to the bright and shining light more than the sun up in the heavens. And we ask that you would make us more and more awake to your glory, living for you, for your good purposes. We thank you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. In 408, now for all the saints, please stand.
Come to the Lord's table here now. And we, excuse me, we've been looking at Peter here in Matthew 26. Uh, we, we saw earlier that Peter had promised that he would never, he would never fail his, his savior. But now we read verse 69 and following said, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crow crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So as we come to the Lord's table today, I'm aware that some of us have had a challenging week or maybe a challenging year. Uh, and you might be tempted to think, you know, I just haven't lived it, lived this life with faith the way that I should. And, and I feel that I've, I'm a bitter disappointment to my sake. And we have to just think, you know, about that for a second say, does, so does this mean that with some of his elect, he looks on them and he's saying, you're not my pride and joy. You're, you're a mistake. I've made a mistake here in, in choosing you and drawing, drawing you to myself. Is that what our savior is saying? Or isn't he now looking at you in love? Doesn't he reassure you like he would with Peter? That I have prayed for you, he says in another gospel, that your faith may not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brothers. Maybe this is just a moment of that return. That's all. And he's, he's actually looking now and saying, Saying to the host of heaven, do you see so-and-so out there? Look at this. They're my pride and joy. My pride and joy. Look at that. They're here. They're celebrating. They matter to me. Their life is a book worth reading. And all of that is because the gospel is a story worth knowing. Because Jesus is the Savior who saves he gave his body for you. He shed his blood for you. And you've been brought to believe that and to be admitted to the table of the Lord. If this is your story, I just want to 
invite you here to partake of this food. You're not uh, a disgraced son or daughter who is beyond the Savior's love. No. You're, you're a fallible, sinful person whom God has set his loving affection upon, and he will absolutely never let you go. So let's ask for the Lord's blessing upon this meal as we would take that to heart. And if there's anybody outside of that situation today and you want to you want to profess that faith, come and see me. Father, thank you for the love that will not let me go. We rest in thee. And now we would partake of the bread and the cup with a new sense of assurance that we matter to you today. May this meal then be especially sweet for your children here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am not my own. I belong with body and soul, both in this in, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins. He paid with this precious blood. With that blood, he set me free. Set me free from all the power of the devil. He preserves me now in such a way that without the will of my heavenly father, even a hair cannot fall from my head. All things must work together now for my salvation. By his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life. By that Holy Spirit, he changes me, makes me heartily willing and truly ready from now on to live for him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. 
said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Oh, Lord, our God, protect us body and soul here today. And bless your children. Help us, Lord. We would serve and follow you this day. And just to give you all the praise. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In 374, let's stand. All hail the power of Jesus' name.
that can sing maybe an octave lower. <laughs> but I really did love what it said in verse four. Sinners whose love can never forget the wormwood and the wrong. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him more of all. Yes, yeah, he, we're sinners. And uh, sometimes we just can't forget that. Um, but He's the one who's saying, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. And we're the ones saying, when did we, can I, when did we do that, Lord? He said, well, whatever, whenever you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did that to me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forever and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. Amen.